Susan, I have to apologize. No. Yes, I keep trying to one-up you on everything. The kids, the house, clothes. Clothes, come on. I do, it's awful. It's a bad habit. Well, I appreciate you admitting that. <laughs> I always see you as near perfect. Oh no, no. <laughs> Truth be told, I'm a mess. Yeah, I mean, the kids are struggling in school and I can't keep the house clean and I eat a slice of cake, I gain three pounds. <laughs> you think that's bad? My daughter still doesn't know her sight words. I'm too embarrassed to have anyone in my kitchen and I gain weight if I so much as smell sugar. I made cookies last week. I didn't eat them, I just touched them. Four pounds. I gained two pounds yesterday. Well, that's not that bad. Well, on a fast. Well, welcome this morning. We are in our second week of a series called The Comparison Trap. And we've been talking about this tendency that we all have to compare ourselves to each other. And a lot of us do this when we're on social media. Maybe it's uh, Facebook or it's Instagram. We look at the different pictures and we say, I want that family. Or we say, man, I wish my kid was as smart as their kid. And we do this throughout uh, our lives, and, and we talked about that uh, last week. And the thing is, is that we do this every day without realizing it. We just kind of subconsciously do it. It's very natural to us. And my wife and I, any, any of you guys been convicted about this lately? As we talked about this last week, Allie and I have been talking about just how bad we are at doing this comparison thing. I mean, we do it all the time, and, and, and we just, we gotta stop it. And, and so we gotta apply the things that we learned and the things that we're gonna learn this week so that we stop doing this thing. And we talked about how we want bigger errors to describe us when people uh, you know, talk about us. And we, we talked about this last week. We talked about uh, you know, there is no win in comparison. That was our big takeaway last week, is that there's no win in comparison. And we talked about how we want, when people talk about us, to say that we're richer, and that we're skinnier, and that we're smarter, and that we're taller, and prettier, and happier, and hipper, and more talented-er. Okay? And, 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 and for some of us, we're, uh, you know, we do this thing where we look up and we say, I want to be as pretty as that woman, or I want to be as uh, you know, skinny as that person, or as great a golf player as that person. And so we slave to become these things. But then we also compare down. Okay? And so we look down and we say, man, look at that guy. He's heavier. He's poorer. He's shorter. He's nerdier. And, and what we do is we either compare up or we compare down. That's the only two ways. And, and, and Marty you know, always says this. We compare up when it comes to material possessions, and we compare down when it comes to morals. Okay, because when we find those people that are morally depraved or you know struggling, we compare down. We say, oh well, look, it's okay because they struggle with this. I'm doing better. I feel better about myself. You know, and then when it comes materially, we want what everyone else has. We want the nicer house. We want the nicer boat. We want the nicer clothes. You know, whatever it is. And some of us are not content with having bigger errors describing us. We fall into a completely different category, and we fall into the S category, where we want to be the richest, we want to be the smartest, the happiest, and the healthiest. And, and, and any, any of you guys type A personalities? Usually they sit in the front row. Okay, so Sherry. Sherry is the type A personality. And this comparison thing, as we talked about last week, brings on a depression. It brings on this depression because we look around and we look to other people and we say, I wish we had what they had. And you just get depressed because you're, chances are you're not going to be able to you know, catch up to them or make the money that they're making or attain the things that they have. And it, it's also very dangerous. Comparison is very dangerous because we fall into debt when we do this comparison thing. And a lot of us are driving things, we're wearing things, we're living in things that we can't afford. And we fall into this, this debt, and everyone knows that debt is not good. And we talked about also last week how when we fall into this comparison trap, 
we're not free. There is no freedom when we compare ourselves to other people because who are we basing our decisions on? We're basing our decisions on what everyone else is doing. And that's not freedom at all. Because you should be able to make decisions based on, you know, on yourself and based on God's will for your life. And we're going to be talking about that uh, today. And so we, we also looked at uh, Scripture, and we looked at Solomon. Solomon kind of helped us with this comparison thing. And he talked about how it's meaningless. Okay, we, 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 he says that the reason that we do this comparison thing is because we are in competition because we envy each other. And envy is the root of comparison. And it, it, he says this, he says, envy is like cancer to the bones. Okay, and so when we envy, it literally it eats us from the inside out. And we're never satisfied when we do this comparison thing. There's never a finish line. There's never a sense of satisfaction. We just are always just not peaceful with our lives. And uh, I left you with a really hard question, and I hope you guys all you know, looked at this question and asked yourself this question. What or who am I using as my reference point to tell me that I'm okay? Because each and every person is in this room is using some type of person or some type of reference point to tell them that they're okay. For students in the room, you guys are using your GPA maybe. You, you're using the school that you go to to tell you that you're okay or that you're worth something. Uh, for others of us, we're looking to our neighbor. We're looking to our boss to tell us that we're okay. You know, if, if, if my boss tells me I'm doing good, then I feel good about myself. Okay? If, uh, if I have enough of uh, you know, the money that I'm making, I feel good about myself. If I'm recognized by those around me, I feel good about myself. Okay? And, 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 and this comes, and uh, Christianity offers a, a reason why we do this thing, and it's, it's called, it's a, it's a whisper almost. And it's, it's as if there's this whisper in each and every one of us that tells us that we're not Okay that we need more. It's almost, it's an insecurity. And it, asks, it leads us to ask questions like this. I wonder if I'm okay. I wonder if I measure up. I wonder if he or she will always love me. I wonder how my kids view me. We all ask ourselves these questions because deep down inside we have this insecurity. And because of that insecurity, we fall into the comparison trap to try to make ourselves feel better um, about ourselves. And uh, the next slide is, I need some of what they have to make me acceptable, lovable, and respectable. And so we fall into this belief that that's what we need. We need what somebody else has. We need more material possessions so that I can be acceptable, lovable, and respectable. And today, we're going to be looking at the book of Galatians. And uh, the book of Galatians was written by Paul, the Apostle Paul. And Paul, if you guys know, a lot of you guys know this, that Paul wrote half of the New Testament. So he's a, he's a big deal. And uh, the book of Galatians is an ancient manuscript that was written to the church of Galatia. Okay? And, and in this book, uh, Paul gives us a clue as to how we can overcome this thing that we do, this comparison thing that we fall uh, you know, into the trap of, of doing. And it's in Galatians 4 5. If you guys want to open up your Bibles, it's in Galatians 4 5. If you guys don't have a Bible, it'll be up on the screen. And here's what it says But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, for some of us, we've been going to church a while and we know what that means. We, that, that's not new terminology for us, born under the law. But Others of us, we don't, we don't know what that is. And so let me kind of explain that to you. We, each and every person in this room, is born and was born under the law of God. And that law is found in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that law is written onto our hearts. That's what the Bible says, is that that law is written into our hearts. And so the, as we go through life, we ask ourselves and we tell ourselves, I should or I shouldn't. I ought or I, sh you know, I oughtn't do that. <laughs> okay. And so does anyone know how to say that properly? I don't, I don't know. 
I ought not, thank you, type A personality, Sherry, in the front row. And so we should or we shouldn't. Okay, and we, t- we, we ask ourselves, you know, is, 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 uh, you know, is that what, what we should do? And, and it's written into our hearts. It's written into our hearts. And some of you guys, have any of you guys uh, read C.S. Lewis? Any of you guys fans of C.S. Lewis? Wonderful, wonderful, one of my favorite authors. And uh, Marty preached a sermon on this. He said, one of the things that is top 12 things that Christians should do is read. So I recommend that you go and you pick up C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, because it will change and it will rock your world. It will change your perspective. And he talks about this, this idea of, you know, this law written onto our hearts in very, very, you know, in, in depth. And I, he uses an example. I'm going to kind of change the example for our context, but he uses the example of, a, of being on a bus. So I'm going to change it to coming to church and finding your seat. Now, here's the thing. A lot of us, when we come to church, we kind of have this assigned seating most of the time, okay? Sherry sits in the front row. She, that's her seat, okay? Usually, Scott back there is sitting in my seat, okay? So that's okay. I, I'll get it back next week, okay? And so when you come into church, if someone is sitting in your seat, a lot of you aren't going to you know, completely get upset and go, oh my gosh, Sherry is sitting in my seat, and flip out, hopefully. Some of you guys might. But most of you are going to say, you know what? She got there first. It's okay. And go find another seat. Probably very close to it and just be looking back <laughs> the whole entire time going, Ugh. Anyway, now what if you came in this morning and you put your stuff down on the table, your backpack, whatever it is, your Bible, and you walk away and you're socializing, and you come back, and there's someone in your seat. And they intentionally moved your stuff out of that seat and put it somewhere nearby, maybe on the floor, okay? And you're going, what? Are you serious right now? Do you see the difference in that? Because... Deep down inside, we know if someone gets there first, it's okay. That's okay. But someone intentionally moves your stuff to get into your seat, that's completely different because it was was done out of, I don't even know, evil, I guess. (laughs) It was rooted in evil. Okay, and so that, that law is written in our hearts. And I asked you guys a question, very tough question, last week. And it, it, you know, who would you secretly enjoy seeing fail. Who would you secretly enjoy seeing fail? Because when we do this comparison stuff, we go, man, I I would love it if that person failed because if they trip, then I can run forward and I can be ahead of them. And and, and this question very much reflects that, you know, that law written into our hearts because when we do it, we know that we're not supposed to be saying that. You don't want anyone to know that you secretly, you know, wish someone you know, has a problem in their marriage or has financial problems. You don't want anyone to know that. And so you push it down. You go, ooh, oh, my gosh, where did that come from? And what's happening there is that that action is mirrored to God's law written on your heart. And you go, oh, no, I I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. Okay? And, you know, for, for us, as we go throughout life, we, go, we, we, we know that there's something wrong and we do this comparison thing because we want to make ourselves feel better about our situation. And we look at the people that we think have it together and come to find out that they don't have it together. You look up to someone who maybe is famous, a famous author, and then a few years later they write a book, tell all about what's going on in their lives, and you go, wait a second, oh my goodness. You look at Tiger Woods. I mean, he was all-American golfer, not a blemish. And then out of nowhere, you find out that he has, you know, these problems, and you're like, ugh, wow. So even the people that we think have it together don't have it together. And any of you guys familiar with Tom Brady? Any Any Patriots fans? Patriots fans? There we go. Okay, we got some Patriots fans. Awesome. Love Tom Brady. All-American. Okay, we got people doing the... the... 
Oh, he's from Michigan. Because you're Ohio. Okay, I get it. You hate anything Michigan. Yeah. And so, Tom Brady, we think of him and we think, wow, this guy's got it together. I mean, he is rich, making millions, tens of millions of dollars. He's got a hot, you know, <laughs> model wife, Brazilian, okay? And you think he's got it together. And I want to show you guys this video real quick about an interview on 60 Minutes. Tom Brady, the quarterback of the New England Patriots, is not only one of the NFL's best players, he's one of the NFL's great stories. At the tender age of 30, he has already won three Super Bowls, an accomplishment that ranks him with some of the best quarterbacks ever to play the game. And he's having one of the greatest seasons in pro football history. When we first reported on him back in 2005, he seemed underrated and almost overlooked. He doesn't have the arm of Peyton Manning, and he doesn't have tattoos, and he doesn't take steroids, and he's never held out for more money. All he knows how to do is win. <laughs> it's what you always wanted. <laughs> You're right. You're right. It has. And I didn't think it came with all the other baggage, though. In addition to his success on the field and his sex appeal off it, there is also the $60 million 10-year contract to play with the Patriots. I mean, I'm making more money now than I ever thought I could ever make playing football. <laughs> But with all that money, fame, and career accomplishments, we were surprised to hear this from him. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and, and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life is me. I thank God. It's got to be more than this. What's the answer? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. So that, that is surprising to hear that from someone who has everything, really. And men, how many of you wish you could be Tom Brady for a day? Come on now. I know I wish I could. You guys are honest. Thank you. Honest. And, and, and he even says, yeah, there's got to be more to this. He's accomplished everything. And so as we do this comparison trap, we push ourselves to gain these things so that we have purpose. And people will tell us that we're good. And you know people are telling Tom Brady, you're amazing. You're the best. I love you. Women are throwing themselves onto him. He's going to be like, get, okay? He's, I mean, this guy is on the top of the world. And yet he has this disconnection. He wonders, there's got to be more to this. And the, there's actually... You know, the, the point is this. Even if you had more money, you would still wonder. Even if you had a bigger house, you would still wonder. Even if you were on, at the top of your company, you would still wonder. Okay, and the reason that we wonder is because there is a break in the creator-creation um, relationship. Okay, there's a break in the creator creation relationship. We were all born into this sinful life, and it creates a break between us and God. Okay? And that break is what creates this insecurity in each and every one of us. We wonder, you know, what is, what is this about? Why am I here? And all the material possessions in the world can never, ever fill that void that is created from that brokenness that is present between us and God. And so we have it all backwards. We have it all backwards. We have, we're in backwards thinking. Because when we do this comparison thing, what happens is, is that we try to find our worth in our accomplishments. If you go to the next slide. And we believe that who we are is based on our accomplishments and what others think of us. Completely backwards thinking. Because we believe who we are is what we do. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm a pastor. And you find your identity in those things. And I'm not saying accomplishments are, are bad things. You know, and, 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 and accomplishing things and doing things is a bad thing. But not if you find your, your, your worth from it. Not if you try to find your identity in it. Because that's not what God calls us to do. And as we go on in, in our scripture, in, in Galatians, it says, 
God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were slaves to the law. To redeem those who were slaves to the law. And the word redeem means to buy back. It's a transactional term. And, and so Jesus had this currency, this spiritual currency that we, we don't have. And there is nothing that we can do ourselves to ever fix that, to ever pay back that debt. And so God, Jesus, redeemed us into this relationship. And what Jesus did on the cross is that he took that broken relationship that we had with God and he mended it. Okay? He left the, the back door to heaven wide open so that we could have access to our Heavenly Father. I mean, that, that is, is, is just amazing. And, um, you know, a lot of us, we just think that, you know, this whole Christianity thing is, is a stamp that we receive. We ask God into our lives and we receive a stamp. And we're good. You know why? Because we're going to heaven. And we're forgiven. And that's it. That we, we, some of us truly believe that. And so we check our boxes off. We check our boxes off. And we, okay, we're good. We're good. We're good. But Christianity is so much more than that. Christianity is so much more than that. And the truth is this. Christianity is about a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And, and here's what it says. So that he could adopt us as his very own children. So that he could adopt us as his very own children. And the truth is this. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just want to forgive you and then that's it and then see you in 50 years. You know, see you in 60 years in heaven. Oh, wait, you made it. Great. No, he wanted you to have a relationship with your father. And if you go to the next slide, here's what it says. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. And this whole idea of adoption is such a big deal. Because back in that time, there was no such thing as adoption. The Hebrews didn't, I mean, adoption, they go, what is that? Okay, ad adoption back in that time was actually a Roman uh, thing. It was a Roman practice. And in the Romans, what they would do is that they would adopt adults. They wouldn't adopt children. Like that, that was unheard of. Adopting a baby and, during this time was unheard of because of the life expectancy. It was a risk. Why would you adopt a baby? And so what they would do is they would wait and they would say, okay, this young man is growing up and he is doing great and he's turned out great. I'm going to adopt him. And they would have a ceremony, and that person would gain and, and, and receive everything and inherit everything that the Roman official or person uh, you know, owned. And, and think about that. It, the, that Roman official knew all the flaws of that, that particular uh, adult or you know, young kid. And it's the same thing with our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father knows every flaw and every mistake that is in us, but yet he still loves us exactly the same. And you've been invited into this relationship, this intimate relationship with God. And we see this because if we read, it says, Abba, Father. Okay, it says, Abba, Father. And if you translate this, okay, the word Abba, there's actually no word in the Greek to really give that, that intimacy that Jesus was speaking of. Okay, because if you use Father, it was too formal. And so Jesus reached down and he tried to find a, a, a more intimate word to describe this new relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father. And it was the word Abba, and it's actually an Aramaic word. And Abba means dad. It means daddy. And so what, what Jesus did was look and said is, look, I want you guys to have a relationship with your heavenly father and call him daddy. Call him your daddy. And a lot of us, we hear that and we go, oh, that's uncomfortable. Why do you call God daddy? That makes you feel uncomfortable. It makes a lot of us feel uncomfortable. But that's exactly what God and Jesus came to do is to give us that intimate relationship with him. And so Tom Brady, until he gets this point, until he sees this, he's always going to try to attain and never reach to the point 
where he's fulfilled. And for us, that's our solution. When we fall into this comparison trap where we're looking to our left and we're looking to our right, is I am a child of God. And God is my daddy. And he wants me to have an intimate relationship with him. The most intimate relationship that you can have where you talk about things and you share things. And I mean, it, it, it's absolutely uh, wonderful. And the next slide that I have for you is who does your heavenly father compare you to? Who does our heavenly father compare us to? No one. Does your heavenly father compare you to the person next to you? No. God doesn't compare you to anyone. So why in the world are we comparing each other to everybody else? Isn't that backwards thinking? Why are we comparing each other to everybody else? Okay, and your estimation of who you are and it should come from God. Because okay? whose estimation should you believe, yours or God? Because our estimation comes from the things that we're doing. Our estimation comes from the things that we're trying to accomplish. And our estimation comes from what my wife thinks about me or what my daughter thinks about me. When really we should be taking our estimation from God and who God says we are. Okay? And, and think about this. Think about parents, parents in the room. You love your children, don't you? You love your children. And a lot of our, you guys have older children, you know, they're going through that insecure phase in junior high, and they're like, I'm not pretty enough. You know, I'm not smart enough. And, and what is the feeling that you think of, parents, when, when your, your kids are saying this? You go, no, you are. And you wish you can just sit them down and say, you are worth it, you are amazing, because you see them in a completely different way than they see themselves. And it's the same thing with God. Okay? And God would say this. He would say, I love you unconditionally because you're my child. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter if Susie is ahead of you. It doesn't matter if you know, you're not as rich as you know, this particular person. I love you the way you are. And then he would also say this. You know, he's not done with you, but he is fine with you. Because a lot of us, we have to work, and we're becoming better people. So God's not going to leave you the way that you are. Okay? He's going to work in you, but he's fine with who you are and exactly who you are. Because as we just learned, we're a child. We're his child. You know, God is our, our dad. And, and that's where we should find our identity. Not that backwards thinking where we think it's accomplishments and what people say about us. Okay? And so... Take your cue about you from the one who made you, loves you, and redeemed you. Not from every, anything else that this world has to offer. Okay? Because what you're going to realize is that God has a will for you. God has a specific plan for each and every person in this room. And that's, that's where you should be, is, is looking towards his will, being in the middle of his will. Because when we do, we find there is peace in our lives. And that peace that surpasses all understanding will be a part of, of your life, and you're going to go, man, it doesn't matter that I don't live in this big house. It doesn't matter that I don't drive that. All that matters is that I am at the center of God's will. So let me pray for us, and we'll be done. Father God, thank you so much for the work that you're doing, Jesus, in each and every one of our lives. And we just pray, Father, that we can see there is no win in comparison. There's absolutely no, no meaning in trying to be better than somebody else or if someone else is better than us. And Father, I just pray that we can see and find our worth in you. Because imagine what that would do if that moved from our head into our hearts. And that we truly believed that we were meant to have an intimate relationship with you. And would come, we could come forth and call you our dad. 
In your name we pray, amen. To feel the Father's love, to feel the overwhelming, crushing beauty of being completely known, every thought, every deed, completely known, and yet completely adored is, is overwhelmingly fantastic and beautiful. And, and it is my heart and my prayer that, that somehow you reach out to that man, to that God, to that spirit, and allow him into your heart and feel the warmth and the joy of that crushingly beautiful embrace. Let's stand. Let's turn our eyes upon him.